Mike Radich here, and I'm now joined on the phone by Bellator featherweight Emmanuel Sanchez. Emmanuel, how are you? Doing very well, sir. How are you today? I'm doing good. I'm doing good. Thanks for asking. Emmanuel, the name of the game is really random. That's where I ask you a random question and you give me the real answer. Some of these questions are custom made just for you, and some of these questions are generic ones that I ask all the people I interview. So, here's the first question. Superpower you'd love to have? Man, that is a good one. Superpower I'd love to have. Wow. I'd have to go with the ability to uh, teleport. Favorite movie? Favorite movie. Ooh, man. Very good one. Wow, there's so many. But, um, Kung Fu Panda. Favorite color? Red. Favorite guilty pleasure? Chocolate. Anything with chocolate. Emmanuel, back on January 21st at Bellator 170, you defeated Georgie Karakanyan via majority decision. How pleased were you with your performance in the fight? You know, yeah, there's positive and negatives from it, but mm-hmm. um, I, I'm actually I'm, you know, pleased with the win, not pleased with a lot of things that happened mm-hmm. you know, in this fight. And obviously with the way I want to, mm-hmm. you know, um, I was looking for the finish. I'm always looking for the finish. But uh, taking positives from it, I did grow a lot. Uh, you know, I was in the you know in the ring with a very uh, experienced, talented killer. You know, uh, George is a killer, and uh, I was able to uh, shut him down everywhere. I felt like I dictated the fight everywhere it went. Does it bother you that more people are talking about how bad the referee performed rather than what a big win this was for you? Because, like you mentioned. Georgie Karkanian, he's a killer. He's a former world champion. He's been in there with so many great guys. He's beaten a lot of great guys. This is a huge win for you. But more people are talking about how poorly the referee handled the fight than how good you look. Um, yeah, you know, that, that doesn't bother me. Because, I mean, to me, that kind of sounds like, all right, it was like they were on my side, mm-hmm. I guess you could say. Because sure. I didn't intentionally knee him to the head. Sure. I don't think I actually did knee him. And then, obviously, the point deduction, too, made the whole fight, you know, just scattered and uh, it was just bad but um it is what it is i hope that i never get that guy to rest my fights again uh i'm not you know uh putting the rest down or whatever mm-hmm. i just feel like no one's perfect he made a mistake but you know it is what it is and i'll have to like i said take it with positives and negatives now, I'm pretty sure after the fight, I saw Duke Rufus go over and say something to the referee. Do you know what he said? <laughs> yeah, I'm going to have to censor it a bit. <laughs> uh, you know, he uh, basically told him what kind of BS call was that. Mm-hmm. Uh, how much are you going home with tonight? Because you could have just caught my guy, you know, uh, this X amount, you know, mm-hmm. on another paycheck, you know, so... And, yeah, he wasn't very happy with that at all. Mm-hmm. But, um, you know, what we are happy about is that uh, I, I showed a lot uh, of improvement in my game, and uh, it's only getting better. Before you heard the judges' scorecards, did you think it was a draw? Because, obviously, you made a, a face that was kind of like, you know, what, what's going on here after the first scorecard came back and it said that it had it as a draw. Did you think that it was going to be a draw, or did you clearly think that you won all three rounds? And even though you had that one even round, because the point taken away. I was very confident that I would win and that, you know, I think these judges needed to get closer look at all these other things. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, in my point of view, I get it, it's an opinion, but at the same time, we watching the fight, okay, yeah, he had his moments, but he did no damage. So I, I don't understand how you can score it for someone who's not effectively trying to finish the fight, you know? Um, I, that right there, I'm, I'm flabbergasted on that. You know, the same thing with some, some of my previous fights, too. I get it, maybe some guys scored some takedowns, but, I mean, if they're going to go by what wrestling rules, you know, scoring takedowns, why don't they give me points for escaping? Because I escape a lot and I get up too. So I don't see why isn't that me showing some effective grappling by, you know, beating someone, trying to stay on top of me or submit me, and I end up on top. You know, I'm doing something completely different. I'm fighting off my back. I'm striking. I'm hunting for submissions. You know, uh, there was no point in time in the fight where I felt threatened in the submission by him at all. So... You know, I, I, in that sense, I don't understand, but like I said, it was, I mean, I did have that look on my face because when I hear, I, I 
want to know what some of these judges are thinking or watching, you know? I, I, I don't understand. But I'm glad uh, the judges that, you know, did, yeah, I had it for me. So thank God for that. <laughs> what was your game plan going into the fight, and how well did you execute it? My game plan was to actually just always the same, you know, go forward. I, I, I always press the action, and uh, I always just make guys uncomfortable. I make uh, guys uh, be broken by my rhythms my speed, my rhythm, my strength, my ferocity, all the above. And um, now I feel like I'm I'm very more unpredictable. You know, a lot of people think that maybe I'm just, I don't know, trying to go out and knock them out, but I'm actually, you know, I'm looking for takedowns, I'm looking for the clinch, I'm looking for top position. Um, you know, I'm completely looking to dominate the fight. So I know Georgie was great going forwards, but when he was going backwards or when he wasn't having his way, that's when uh, I could see that that's where he didn't shine or that's when he didn't do his greatest. So I knew I had to be first and I had to get going right away. And, yeah, I, I felt uh, tremendous in doing so. Outside of what the referee did, and, of course, what the referee did was very surprising because he took a point away without a warning, which we rarely ever see. But besides what the referee did, did anything in this fight surprise you? Uh, well, aside from that, no. <laughs> You know, um, I feel like because I, I was so mentally, physically, emotionally, spiritually into the fight and uh, just so hungry for the win, I just wanted to win so bad. It's another thing I feel like I have over a lot of guys, too. I just want it more, and I believe it shows in my fight um, by me proving that I, I wanted it more, and I went out and I fought everywhere and fought tooth and nail to, like I said, go have the submission, have the, the TKO finish, anything, you know, uh that's uh, you know what got me the edge, and nothing really surprised me from it other than you know I'm, it's just another continued step up, learning, growing. You know, you watch some of my earlier fights; it was a little more gritty, and you know I'm not I didn't take any damage, but I did get headbutted, and my face didn't look the greatest afterwards, and I wasn't very happy about that. And uh, you know, one fight in particular, actually, but uh, you know after that, and now being more uh, how should I say? Uh, I'm being more aggressive, but much more technical as well. Uh, I'm feeling much more and more comfortable there each time, and I'm showing something different and new each time. After the fight, you were talking with Georgie Karakanian. What did you say to him, and what did he say to you? Um, honestly, you know, I don't know what's out there in the media, but he personally, man to man, he told me, you know, he's like, you got me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he's like, I couldn't get you, and you got me. Like, you won. Like, he, you know, let me know that, uh, you know, that I beat him, basically, that I was the better man. And I told him, I was like, you know, you're the toughest guy, you know, I faced, you know, one of the, I saw I've been facing his tough guys, but I knew how much of a killer, like, this man was, you know. And uh, I just told him, thank you very much, and my, all my respect to you. How many times have you gone back and watched the fight? Um, twice. Because it was like bits and pieces of clips. Obviously, I was watching what I wanted to watch about myself. But then when I watched the full fight, I was like, oh, okay. Now, you know, I'm always I'm my worst, biggest critic. Uh, and always continuing to be like, all right, I should have done this, could have done that. So, you know, it's, again, just you win or you learn. So it's just all learning to be even better for the next time around. How did you celebrate the win? We went out for sushi afterwards. You know, LA is <laughs> popular for sushi. So that was nice. It was, uh, it was it was pricey, but it was good. And, uh, you know, I, I don't do vacations, man. It's crazy. I've just, uh, I've been in the gym since, you know, since I got back from uh, from L.A. So, you know, uh, training, teaching. I teach kids jiu-jitsu class here and uh, at Rufus Sport. So uh, doing uh, private lessons and just uh, just myself continuing to, to, to grow and be better. I just always want to get better, work on something new, learn something new, evolve. And, uh, you know, there'll be a time for a vacation someday. The first things first is to continue to go on, 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 and uh, go for the belt. This was the third big Bellator event that you were a part of. The first one was Bellator 145. The second one was Bellator 149, which was the Shamrock Hoist Gracie fight. And then, of course, this Bellator 170 card was Chael Sonnen versus Tito Ortiz. So you've been on these big cards. And what Scott Coker 
is trying to do is something that's been around in this sport for a very long time. He's taken a page right out of the Japanese playbook because in Japan for many, many years, in Pride and some of these other organizations, they put on one really big fight that, that gets a lot of people excited and brings a lot of attention, and then they build the guys who are on the undercard up because so many people are tuning in for that one fight. They come and look around and go, oh, you know, I'm here for this one fight, but this other guy who's on the undercard, he performed well, so I'm going to keep watching him. So that, it, it's nothing new the concept that they're doing, but that's their game plan. The game plan is to have these big fights at the top and then build up the guys from the bottom. And since you've been on a couple of these events recently, have you gotten the rub? Are you noticing that that more people are aware of you? Are you getting more followers on social media? Are more sponsors coming in? Are 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 you getting more sponsorship dollars? You know, are you getting the rub from being a part of these big events? Um, you know, slowly but surely, of course. Mm-hmm. Um, I have, you know, you just saw me wearing Vaporfly last time around, mm-hmm. so that was good, you know. Um, I know bigger ones will come. I'm not one that just go out and, I mean, no offense to anyone who does do this, but I mean, I understand that um, I get, I'm representing product and I'm good and, you know, I want to represent a brand, a label, whoever wants mm, to support me. But at the same time, I'm not going out looking for that, being in the league, asking for money or doing this. Thank God the majority of my sponsors are um, people who, you know, uh, supply my training needs. So I have everything I need, I really do for my training, clothes, gear, etc. cetera. Um, and uh, on mouthpiece, you know, the, the most important, you know, things, the training essentials for, also for, for the fight as well. But um, I know other bigger, better things will come along too. And all that stuff will will come. You know that sometimes guys early on will almost expect it and wonder why they're not having it right away. But all you know, good, great things take time. So uh, you got to build yourself up. You got to put yourself out there. And I want to do that by my fights. I let my fist do the talking, and I'll let that promote you know myself right then and there. And then I'll uh, you know I'll allow all those other things to come. I'm absolutely fascinated by the Bellator featherweight division because if you look at the history of this division, it's really only been controlled by three guys. You have Pat Curran, you have Daniel Strauss, and you have Pitbull. They're kind of like champion gatekeepers because they beat up everyone else, and then when they, they trade the belt between the three of them, it's the craziest thing ever. Because usually, you know, we've seen dominant champions before, like GSP and Demetrius Johnson and all these guys, but they but they're just you know holding onto the belt for a very long time. This this time around, these guys are killing off all the contenders, but then when it gets to them, they're all beating each other. It's it's like the craziest thing ever. Same thing with 135 in Bellator, and you know, there's Tier One, which is Pitbull, Strauss, and Curran. And then there's Tier 2, which is where you are at with, with guys like Daniel Veitchel and A.J. McKee and some of these other guys in Bellator that are fighting to get into that title picture. I, I'm pretty sure Veitchel is going to get the next title shot, but you get what I'm saying. There's still that, that separation of power. What do you need to do to get into that? Is it just you, you need to be more vocal? Is it you need to just put together a few more wins? Do you need a highlight real finish? You know, What do you have to do to get into that title picture so that you can break that cycle? I think all of the above, you know. Uh, not only just being more vocal, asking for it, of course, but uh, I think more than anything, uh, top contender, top uh, you know, one of these fighters, one of these guys in the, the top five even, and then uh, a dominating finish or just complete dominating performance that you can't deny me, you know, my uh, the right to the title shot. Obviously, Vital, you know, has earned it for the sense that he's on a win streak since he lost to Pitbull, and that's the fight right now that makes sense, you know, Daniel versus Daniel, mm-hmm. plus those two have never fought each other, so right. it's something that they can promote and make some, you know, something great out of it either way. And, uh, you know, I like Strauss, but uh, if Daniel Vitro goes out and becomes champion, then that's perfect. I get off another win, and then boom, Vitro versus Sanchez too, because I believe, and he knows this too, that he didn't beat me, so... Uh, I think that just makes, uh, you know, my case, my shot for the title just right there, because I know I am right there. You, I think you could put me in that mix with those three, because I already faced Curran mm-hmm. on short notice. I fought the man who fought for the title in Daniel Vaito, who could be the champion right now, mm-hmm. you know, when he had Pitbull. And Georgie was supposed to fight for the title mm-hmm. a few years back. So right. no one, I, I'm pretty sure no one should have forgotten about that. And, uh, yeah, short of uh, the champion right now currently in Pitbull, 
that, I mean, you know, that's where I'm at right there. So I know I'm right up there at the top. In my opinion, there's only three fights that make sense for you at this point. A title fight between the winner of Strauss and Vichel, because I'd love to see you fight either one of those guys. I'd love to see you fight Vichel again or Strauss for the first time. I'd like to see that fight. Then AJ McKee, because you guys were supposed to fight. And then a rematch with Pat Curran, because if you look at what he's recently done, his last fight, he beat Georgie Karkanian. Your last fight, you beat Georgie Karkanian. You guys have fought before in the past, and... His last loss was against Daniel Vaitcho, and your last loss was against Daniel Vaitcho. I think that fight makes a lot of sense. What do you think? What's the logical next step for you moving forward? It's funny that you mentioned all those, uh, those facts right there. Cause, yeah, wow. I didn't even, you know, I, uh, forgotten about that. I guess I'd say it would make sense, but, I mean, I don't know how it goes. I mean, considering, you know, he's been injured, he was out, scheduled to fight someone mm-hmm. else as well. And, you know what I mean, his last two wins, or, you know, for him at least, was me and Georgie. But, um, obviously, McKee is right there. Um, but I know there's James Gallagher that they're bumping up now as well. But I know they're going to keep him in Ireland. And, you know, I don't know. Because not only am I right there at the top of the heap, the way I was, just, you know, explaining this to, you know, talking with this to some of the guys from the gym, you know, uh, Strauss got another title shot after uh, they already losing a title fight from beating Henry Corrales, the guy mm-hmm. who just, had just made his debut. You know, and then, boom, he won the title in St. Louis. And I've gone out and I've beat uh, UFC veterans, guys, you know, who didn't start in Bellator. And, you know, my the mainstays that I've fought so far have just been Georgie, Vichel, and Current, which are top, top three guys right there, you mm-hmm. know. So... Um, my debut and my fight after was two guys, new, local, and then, uh, you know, two UFC veterans, and then also the guys that I face now at the top of the heap. But I don't know. They could give me another UFC veteran. Uh, I, I, I don't know. You know, I, I really I don't, I don't pick and choose opponents. I'm a, I'm a company man. Uh, whoever they put out in front of me, that's it. I just know I want to be on the biggest cards, and I want to shine. Hobbies outside of fighting. Uh, video games. Love video games. Uh, obviously training. I don't know if you consider that habit, just a love, a passion. You know, messing around, having fun, or actually working, you know, getting better at my craft. Skateboarding and eating. Do you have any pre-fight rituals or superstitions? Uh, I, uh, I'm so calm uh, ahead of the fight that I, I like to read. Uh, just read anything, you know. Obviously reading uh, my Word of God, reading uh, motivational, inspirational, spiritual uh different books to help lift me up uh, about life and just watching kid movies. Kung Fu Panda 1, 2, 1, 2 3 is you know, my favorite. Just I like to just relax and you think of the things that keep me happy. Do you have any post-fight rituals? Uh, just eating good food, man. Just eating good food. I know we celebrate, we win, you know, or however the fight goes. I know, you know what I mean? I'm just happy that, uh, uh, that I got to do what I love to do and, uh, you know, well, let's go out and enjoy some good food. Obviously, we know you're a fighter. We see you fight all the time on Spike TV. But you're also a lover. You're a guy who who really loves to spread peace and love throughout the world. So why do you fight? Obviously, you can be both. You can be a lover and a fighter. But what's the appeal for a guy who loves peace as much as you do? Why do you fight? Um, Well, when I started right upon graduating high school, um, it was just to be a world champion. You know, Mm -hmm. deep down inside... There's this little kid inside of me that was disappointed that he was never varsity on any sport that he'd ever played. I was never a starter. I was never a coach's favorite. And I never took first in anything that, you know, I did individually as a team. And, you know, I can get a little, uh, what's the word, in-depth with this. I mean, I'm just so competitive that that's something that I want to have back and it's something that I know I can do now. My fourth grade kickball tournament, it was the final game, you know, and this was just between classrooms. And we lost. We lost in the final. And I remember seeing the other class holding the trophy, raising it up high, celebrating, and I just remember my stomach hurting so bad. And I cried my eyes out in the middle of the gymnasium, and I was just so sad just seeing them, you know, and knowing that it slipped through our fingers. And they didn't even get to keep the trophy. I mean, I don't know what to do with it, mm-hmm. but... Just the fact that we didn't, you know, win, <laughs> and mm-hmm. it just hurt so bad. And yeah, I, I, uh, 
I, I had that in wrestling a little bit in junior high. I had that in soccer. I just, uh, I was just always wanted to be a champion, and I uh, wasn't able to excel at the, you know, at the, at the highest level, I guess, with any of those. So now that I'm at this highest level now, uh, I just really want to achieve this goal. Wow, that's deep. Kickball. There's a lot of guys who got into MMA because they didn't get a gold medal at the Olympics in wrestling, but it was kickball that inspired. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Now we know why you're a true competitor. That that stuck with you after all these years. That That's great. I love that. I love stories like that. There, there's a story of uh, John Elway, the quarterback for the Broncos. He would never lose on this pool table. He played every guy that ever played on the Broncos on this pool table, beat everybody. One day he lost. Next day he sold that pool table. He's that competitive. He hates to lose that much. So when I when I hear about this kickball story, I think of that. Yeah, we hate to lose, and then we love to win. You know? And just, you know, we work so hard and sacrifice so much to just do whatever it takes to go out and get my hand raised. Whatever it takes. Besides fighting, what are you passionate about? I have to say, uh, my faith. That's the biggest thing. It's gotten to me to where I'm at now. I know God has provided me with all the opportunities, kept me healthy all throughout this journey in a very physically demanding sport. And I know that that's what has allowed me and enabled me to, to achieve everything that I have had and to continue to go on and do great things for my voice to be heard and to be used however, you know, he wants to, to use me. And uh, my family as well, you know, I, uh, I call myself the golden boy because that's what they called me when I was younger, number one. And number two, you know, same thing as far as being, uh, you know, a champion. Uh, just a professional athlete, someone who could make it at the highest level, seeing as, you know, we and my family come from nothing, nothing but the clothes on their back, and now we're here and have been here, and myself pursuing this, my cousins, you know, getting, pursuing college degrees, um, you know, becoming firefighters, nurses, uh, doctors, uh, everything, you know, police officers, we're, we're here, and we know what it's like coming from humble beginnings, and now we get to go out and be here and really, you know, pursue the the, the great dream and the great freedom that we have and all the opportunities that we have here. If you weren't a pro fighter, what would your job be? Oh man, that's a good question. What would I be doing? Wow, oh, man, I hate to say I don't know, but uh, perhaps a, a masseuse. You know, I really, uh, I'd be working. I knew upon graduation, too, that's what I wanted to do. I kind of wanted to be like a massage therapist, physical therapist, you know, help people. And I kind of get to do that already. You know, I've learned what I've learned already, you know, through martial arts and fighting. And, I mean, I'm not licensed or, you know, that's not my job or a side job out of that. But um, it's something that also I want to continue to learn, too, and, you know, help people because I, you know, teach them kickboxing, all mixed martial arts, jujitsu. At self defense, and you know, I can help them as well too if they got shoulder and knee uh, issues. You know, I may not, but uh, I've learned a lot. And this has enabled me to learn a lot about my own health, others' health, nutrition, all the above. So I know that's probably something that I'd be doing. Have you been training at Rufus Sport since day one? I have not. I actually started my amateur career by myself. Really, you know, I just had someone who could get me fights. I literally started like on YouTube and uh, How to Fight for Dummies. Someone gave me a, a book once as a gift, How to Fight for Dummies. Rich Franklin was on the cover fighting Evan Tanner. <laughs> and I still have it, too, actually. <laughs> and I still, you know, like to read it sometimes when I, uh, you know, just seeing how these other guys back from, you know, Rich uh, Franklin was a, a school math teacher. Someone mm-hmm. else you would never expect to be a fighter. And, you know, it, it's really great to hear other stories and use that as motivation and inspiration for myself as well. And... When I, I moved out to Oregon in 2010, when I was 20 years old, and I uh, started my pro career out there. Uh, again, I was training at a jiu-jitsu academy, but I had to uh, get all my own fights as a professional. I was my own manager as well, and begging people to fight and you know, over the Internet or a phone call, however I could to get a hold of them. Even King of the Cage I couldn't get a hold of to try to get a fight. And finally, uh, I moved back. You know, here is where I consider home. Home is where your mom is in the Midwest, and uh, started training with Duke full-time since 2013, and now I'm at where I'm at talking to you, my man. You train with a lot of killers, guys like Tyron Woodley, Ben Askren, Anthony Pettis, Sergio Pettis, Mike Rhodes, 
Gerald Mearshart, all these great guys. I know I'm, I'm missing a bunch because there's so many, but you get my point. There's a lot of great guys, and you also have a lot of great coaches. So what's better at Rufus Sport, the bodies that you train with or the coaching? Oh, man, that's a good one. You know what? I'd have to say the coaching. You know, uh, Don't get me wrong. The bodies I train with is a great thing, but those guys were made by the coaches. So, mm. you know, granted, uh, not all of these guys here started with Duke uh, as well since day one, but they've all... You know, Duke, Duke Rufus, uh, Coach Scott Cushman, uh, Coach Daniel Barnley, uh, uh, wrestling coach, you know, of course, Ben Askren, Coach Ben Tomes, uh, Justin Lenti, Joe Nichols. Like, we have a large coaching list here, sorry. <laughs> mm-hmm. But it's, uh, the, all our coaches, too, are former fighters. Mm-hmm. So they've all fought, you know, I mean, at the highest level at their time. And they've uh, they've helped us, and they paved the way for us to to be where we're at today, and have where we're at because they not only have the connections as managers, you know, and as businessmen, as, as high level coaches, but also the coaching side of it. We have everything all under one roof. Mm-hmm. And granted, now we have guys like Tyron, Sage Northcutt, Paul Felder's in the house. You know, guys, you know, visiting us. Uh, since I've been here, you know, I've gotten to train with Darren Hawkins. I've gotten to train with Sam Stout. Uh, the list goes on and on and on. Guys that I grew up watching, you know, it's just really, it's crazy. But uh, it, it, it's all because of uh, the coaches, you know, that guys want to come here and train at this great academy as well. Have you ever been in a boring fight? Because if you have, I'd like to know which one that is, because I haven't seen one. You know, honestly, I'd like to say no. <laughs> I mean, speak, speaking humbly, you know, I mean, I, I'm not saying I'm always, you know, looking to be wild, reckless, uh, careless or anything. I'm just, I, I don't know. I just, I've always wanted to be a crowd. That's another, um, you know, I, I have my little, uh, my little quotes, my little raps you can call it, my little run, that I'm no complainer, I'm just an entertainer. Too many guys complain about money, complain about wanting to be on the main card or whatever it may be, you know, sponsors, however, and it's like, man, just do your job. If you go out there and you perform, you leave it all on the line and, you know, whatever it is, if you got a you know, a pink hairdo, a mohawk, a, a, a tattoo on your back that people think is funny, sell it. You gotta sell it, you gotta own it, and you gotta live it. You know what I mean? You mm-hmm. gotta be a crop speaker. There's over 500 fighters on the UFC roster, over 100 something on the Bellator roster. And each weight class is probably over 50 guys. You know what I mean? What separates you from everyone else? Why do fans want to specifically want to watch you fight? You know, is it your mouth? Is it your clothes? Is it your fighting style? You know what I mean? Is it the wild submissions, the wild striking, uh, just a guaranteed crowd pleaser, you know, whatever it may be. So I know I want to stand out from the rest of them. Don't get me wrong. I mean, I was there once where you just want to stare a guy down so mm-hmm. bad. You want to talk trash about him so bad uh, to his face on the Internet, whatever. But, you know what, at the end of the day, all that matters is who wins the fight. And, you know, uh, wins not only wins, but, of course, uh, wins in an exciting fashion, you know, impressively. Uh, I mean, I'll never forget when uh, Gray Maynard got overlooked for a title shot mm-hmm. uh, to Frankie Edgar when Gray Maynard had already beat Frankie. But, you know, when you hear Dana White right out of his mouth say, uh, he's boring and Frankie's more exciting and I, I want Frankie for the title as opposed to, uh, to Gray. And that was pretty crazy to think, you know. So, I mean, I'm not going to say rankings and who's most deserving. Don't get me wrong, that stuff is there. But they want people who are going to sell tickets. Can they promote you? Will you put butts in seats? Will you put eyes, you know, on the TV? That's what I've always wanted to be. Now that I'm at the level where I'm at now, it's not only, okay, hey, be a winner, be a great athlete, be a great ambassador for the sport, but go out there and uh, fight your fight and be exciting. Be the most exciting guy in the division. Be uh you know what? Leave somewhere that people will never forget. Your gas tank is incredible. If you were a car, you'd get 5,000 miles to the gallon. Do you ever get tired? Honestly, no. I've never been tired after a fight. It's pretty crazy. And, you know, you hear me in my last interview, you know, or the commentators even say, with my coaches, they slap me around and say, have you ever been tired after a fight? And I said, no, coach, sorry. And I'm like, well, then that means you need to throw more. Because you, you see me throw a lot, go a lot, do a lot of things. But, I mean, I can still do more. That's me in about third or fourth gear. You know, I, you guys haven't, the world has not seen my six yet. They haven't seen my full throttle yet. So I'm excited, man. It's just, uh, it's just a matter of continuing to grow and just go. I have gas for days. There's no doubt about it. 
you're going for the finish always. In every position, you're always going for the kill. Anyone who sees your fights can see that. And before you got into Bellator and before you started fighting the upper echelon of the division, you were finishing all your opponents. But the stoppages haven't come as of late. Why do you think that is? Is it because you're you're trying too hard for the finish? And we know when you try too hard, it never comes. Is it that? It, are you, are, is your timing just a little bit off? You go back and you watch yourself on film. Oh, you know, if, I, if I'd been a half second or a second faster in that position, I, I could have got the stoppage. You know, why haven't the finishes come? Um, a little bit of a, a little bit of everything, like you just said right there. Yeah, you know, uh, almost looking too much for it, mm-hmm. but I'm working too hard for it. And as my coaches would say, we have our, like I said, our thing. We don't don't work harder, work smarter, and have fun out there. That's the biggest thing. It's have fun because when you look for results too much, you're thinking, I right, punch, punch, kick, knee, elbow, whatever. And it's like, oh, this guy's still standing, and then it makes you kind of confused, or it makes you think so much, and. You know, it was crazy. The fights where I, you know, almost listened to them prior to even getting signed of just where I didn't watch film on my opponents. I didn't know my opponents. I didn't think. I didn't care. I just went out there and had fun. Boom, I put them away in the first round, you know? So now I just have to kind of keep it the same. I'm almost, I feel, putting too much pressure on myself and trying to be so much of a perfectionist where my coaches will say, you know, hey, don't look to be perfect. Just go out there and throw. Have fun. You know, uh, obviously go out there and throw the land. We're not just, you know, throwing reckless strikes or just, you know, throwing softball. But just going out there, putting combinations together and just going out and go forward, you know. When when I've really taken that to heart and seen, and then the fighters that I enjoy watching, like Pacquiao, Golovkin, you know, uh, you know Cain Velasquez, uh, Demetrius Johnson, I, I can see what they're talking about now. And then they have their Thai fighters that they talk about, too, Guo Kao, Sanchai, Yudsen Klai, Lurzilla. I'm like, wow, you know, yeah, this is really crazy. Like, okay, now I can see what they're talking about. And now I just need to do that with the way I train. And then, of course, fight night, do it exactly what I did in training. When you fought against Henry Corrales, obviously you didn't stop him in that fight. You won a decision over him, which was bogus. It wasn't a a split decision. I thought you won all three rounds clearly, but for whatever reason it was a split decision. But that's neither here nor there. Obviously you didn't get the stoppage, but is it a consolation prize that you knocked out his front teeth? It was pretty crazy, man. You know, I I had no idea, obviously. That guy, you know, as my coach would say... Uh, excuse me, but he's got balls of steel. That guy, man, <laughs> he is one tough mother, man, because I'm not saying I was throwing as hard as I could, because I really wasn't, but I was throwing a lot, and, you know, he brought out the Mexican in me, because I, uh, the, like, I'm talking like a real Mexican in me, like, wow, we were fighting, you know, uh, man, blow to blow, because I was trying to be more technical, of course, but, man, every time he threw, I, I was just so uh, hungry to want to hit him back even more, uh, it was crazy, man. That was right there, one of my probably one of my toughest fights because obviously I was head butted, and I just remember thinking like, wow, man, this guy's still standing, and I just head kicked him, I just need him, I just out, I just did this, and I'm just like, damn, this guy's tough. <laughs> but uh, it, it's just a part of learning, and you know what? It, it sucks. <laughs> you know what I mean? My, I wasn't happy with my face after that, but I was happy with the win and. You need fights like that, man, because not all of your fights are going to be, you know, you know, highlight real finishes and 10-second knockouts as much as we love it to. You know, sometimes you're going to have that one person who is still going to be standing there, still going to be trucking and coming forward. And, you know, when he told me at the, at the end, at the, after the fight, he's like, yeah, man, great fight, great fight. He tells me right there and there, he knocked my two front teeth out. And I'm like, what? I'm like, no way. And then... You know, when he went to surgery after, and I went, you know, just to a hotel, but I was like, wow. And then when I see some interviews, he took his, uh, you know, uh, teeth out. Oh, damn. I was like, wow. I had no idea. I, I didn't know which knee it was from. He said it was in the first round. But I thought it was from the flying knee in the second, but, I mean, oh, wow. Uh, yeah, that was, like I said, man, he fought, you know, the whole fight, I guess, with, you know, missing teeth or with loose teeth. And, like, see, that just goes to show you, man, these are some tough mothers out there. You still have all your teeth, right? Absolutely. Okay, good. I'm just checking. I'm just checking because you never know. I never knew that Josh Koscheck didn't have any front teeth, and then he was on Fox doing analyst work for the UFC, takes out all his teeth. I'm like, whoa, how did that happen? So I'm just checking. I'm just checking. Oh, that's crazy. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, I, obviously I know Hughes, Henderson, yeah. 
And I heard GSP's uh, actually got some fake teeth. Yeah, that's what I heard too. Uh, that's what I heard too. I've never seen it, but I, that's, I really, yep. some people have told me too before. And Melvin Manhoff, he has broken bottom teeth. Usually when you, when you see someone get their teeth knocked out, it's usually the uppers. He has lower teeth that are broken. Yeah. So yeah. We know we know Cormier, I think yeah. Joel Romero as well. Ouch, yeah. Mm-hmm. No, man, I, I take as much calcium as I can. Yeah. I take care of my dental as much as I can and invest in a good mouth guard. That's yeah. for sure. Oh, for sure. You got to do that. You can't have that boil and bite crap. Oh, no. You yeah, can't have that. Well, that's the worst thing ever. I won't even train with that. If I don't have my mouthpiece, I'm like, all right, guys, I'm not you know, doing anything. Yeah. Yeah. I've had some close calls, don't get me wrong, <laughs> some things that, I mean, and this is just jujitsu, not even striking or MMA. Jujitsu, where I'm like, oh, man, don't tell me. It's like, I got hit in the, in the spot, and I'm like, oh, thank God. But, uh, yeah, yeah, thank God. Yeah. And I got all my teeth, and yeah, yeah. Yeah, I don't need to deal with any of that. Yeah. Who gave you the nickname El Matador? That was actually from my coach, Duke Rufus, right before I was actually, you know, I started my career at uh, at 55, mm-hmm. and when I was uh, going on to make my first fight at 145, um, we started a home pads for me, and he started to show me these new tricks, and then, you know, he said, this is how you need to fight, and, you know, we need to start calling you the Matador, you need to be a Matador, you know mm-hmm. what I mean? And I'm like... Okay, so I'll fight like a matador, of course. And then, I don't know, it was just one day I was going to send a tweet, and I, was, I texted him before I sent it. I was like, hey, coach, is this my new nickname now? Is this is what we're going to do? And he's like, yes, this is your nickname now. This is what we're going to call you. So ever since then, I you know changed all my names on my forms of social media, and yeah, it's pretty awesome, man. I mean, I have to say I have many different aliases, but out of all of them, my favorite is the matador. I go to MMA events or anywhere, and yep. That's how people. Uh, that's how people know me. It's pretty awesome. So Duke Rufus comes up with all these nicknames, but he also gave you the nickname Overtime. Oh yes, he gave me that nickname too. <laughs> this guy's the best. He should be giving everybody yep, a yeah. nickname. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah, I know, right? So it's like we. Want, I want to call some other guys with the names and stuff, but I'm like, you know what? I'm gonna wait. Duke's got it. And yeah. Once Duke's got it, man, yeah, he's got everybody, you know, rocking and rolling, and all their nicknames are stuck with ever since. Celebrity people say you look like. Uh, you know what? I've had a list of fighters, actually. I've never had any celebrities. Once, actually, when I, uh, I take that back, sorry. Once, when I was in, I was 17 years old working at a Taco Bell, and I had a family come up to me and tell me I look like Mario Lopez. Mm. And I started laughing in their face. I said, are you kidding me? I mean, no disrespect to you guys. It's kind of compliment, but that man is a very good-looking <laughs> man. And even now, like, he looks, you know, he's twice my age, but he looks younger than I do. I'm like, man, that dude stays in good shape, and he's healthy, and, yeah, that's a good-looking dude. You know what I mean? <laughs> um, as far as fighters go, I've been told if I let my facial hair grow out, I look like Patrick Cote. Uh, without it, everyone says, everyone from my gym, everyone says I look like Dos Anjos. Diego Sanchez, that's what people tell me. They, I remind them of Diego Sanchez. Um, who's another fighter? Uh, I think that's it, actually. Sorry, yeah, I think so far yeah, that's, uh, yeah, that's about it. Celebrity crush. Celebrity crush. When I was a kid, I really loved Natasha Hentridge. Uh, she was, yeah, like one of my favorites. I don't know why. I'm, I'm bad. Maybe I'm vain. I've always loved blonde hair and blue eyes. But that's because, you know, I, like I said, I grew up with my family all Mexican. Right. So I've always grown up with uh, black hair, brown eyes, never really seeing any color <laughs> in my life. And uh, once I went to, started to go to school here and everything, I started to see all these different uh, young ladies with blonde hair and blue eyes or green eyes, and I'm like, wow, I'm in love. This is mm-hmm. awesome. Right. Join the club. Join the club. That's my weakness also. <laughs> yeah. So I can relate. <laughs> <laughs> Are you married, engaged, in a relationship, or single and ready to mingle? Yeah, I'm single. No one loves me. <laughs> I just... Uh, <laughs> I guess I could say one of my favorite Michael Jordan quotes being a Chicago native here is uh, I'm just married to the game, and the game is my wife. It requires all my responsibility and attention. It gives me that fulfillment and peace. I mean, I know there will always be a time with that. I've never, you know, said, hey, I'm going to be single, and I hate women. And No, I love women. <laughs> and I think uh, marriage and, you know, having companionship and having a significant other is great. But right now, I'm just uh, focused on me. I just want to, uh, you know, accomplish these great things. And I know one day I'm going to retire, and then I'll have time for that. I'll have time to have a family and a wife and 
probably get fat. Mm, that's about it. <laughs> How many tattoos do you have, and what are the meanings behind these tattoos? Um, I have eight of them. I have two on my chest. One is uh, Japanese kanji, and it's uh, pain and sacrifice. And I'm actually getting my whole chest redone, actually. So it's kind of weird. I want to tell you this. But um, I had fearless with the scripture on it, um, which is, do not be afraid of Isaiah 41.10. Do not be afraid for the Lord is with you, and he will raise your right hand and give you many victories. Um, I have two on my wrists. There's another scripture, Proverbs 21.21, 21, that you see a man skilled at his work, he will stand before kings. And the crown of thorns on my other wrist. On my arms, I have uh, born to be hated, dying to be loved. I actually got that when I was uh, 17 in high school. And I remember I was hiding from my mom for like a week with the sweater on until I finally showed her. I finally had the courage to show her and she wasn't mad. So thank God for that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, I got it because uh, for girls, actually. But it's funny how it, it plays out. You know, I've just gone out to uh, to go out and live this life. And so many people, sometimes I feel... Uh, what's the word, stereotype, criticized fighters saying that oh, this, all the fighters are the same and this is how they are and, you know what I mean, full of themselves, thinking they can get any the girl they want or whatever, but now I'm something completely different, you know what I mean? They uh, don't put me in a box. I'm something completely different and, you know, I hate to say it, but, you know, you don't know me, so don't judge me if you don't know me. Um, I have a cross on my leg, which is my, with my grandfather's initials on it. He lost that fight to cancer. And, yep, I got it in memory of him in his hands, and I'll probably, maybe I'll add some little more on it, see how I feel, I don't know. I feel like I'm done, I feel like I'm good, because these are all uh, on even spots on me, you know, on each limb, so, like, it works out perfectly, I don't need to add anywhere else, and I don't have, like, right now in my mind, too, I don't have the desire to add anything else. Just don't get a gorilla on your chest or a tiger on your stomach. Word of yeah, advice. That, <laughs> yeah, that that looks terrible. That looks like someone took a crap on his chest. I mean, he's a great fighter, biggest star in the sport, but come on, that just that's just ugly. It's terrible. Oh yeah, definitely not. Yeah, yeah. I, that's what I was thinking. That's why I never got one on my back. I was always like, when I thought of tattoos, I was like, man, if you're gonna get something, why don't you get something that you can see? Number one, show off, and then I mean, I don't know. I mean, still kind of covered. And then, like I said, show off and something that you can see and then something that, you know, like, makes sense. Tattoo that makes sense. You know what I mean? Like, all right, this is what... Yeah, like, I really like Aldo and Gustafson has a two. They're teeth, and then they... At each fight, they add uh, a win. They add, like, mm. something on their, on their mm-hmm. teeth. I think that's pretty cool. Favorite food? Favorite food. Man, that's tough. I'm a fat kid. I love to eat. Um, but, you know, you're talking post-fight and everything. I just have to go with uh, pizza. Favorite band and or solo artist? Uh, band and or solo artist. Um, ooh, that's a tough one. I guess just keep that. Well, you know what? Yeah, I will say. Because there, there's so many artists. But you know what? This man was a positive role model. And, you know, uh, issues in life was so positive. Uh, Michael Jackson. Favorite TV show? And it can be a show currently on the air or a show no longer on the air. Just overall, favorite TV show. Oh, man, that's a good one, huh? Um, it was South Park when I was younger, now it's just gotten crude, but The Simpsons, you can never go wrong with The Simpsons, that's a class. If you could trade places with anyone in the world for a week, who would you trade places with, and why? Anyone for a week, wow. Man, that's such a, wow, that's a good one. Trade places with anyone for a week. I guess I'd have to say maybe the president, you know, and to see what it's like, and then, you know... See what I, I can do with what it's like to, you know, run a country. If you could stay one age forever, how old would you stay and why? You know what? I'm loving life right now. Uh, it's really great, and I know great, greater things are coming, so I have to say right now. You know, I feel like in my top physical prime. Um, I don't heal as fast as I did when I was 20, but you know what? Uh, that's good. You know what I mean? I know I'm still young and I'm still healthy, and yeah, life is good. Go-to song when you're singing in the shower. Go-to song when I'm singing in the shower. Hmm, that's a good one. Oh, wow. I don't know, I listen to so many different forms of music. It's hard to do it. And that's a um, pretty young thing, Michael Jackson. What's the best thing that ever happened to you? Uh, oh, man, that was, that's a tough one. 
I guess becoming the jiu-jitsu coach here at my great academy. That you know, it's, uh, it's very rewarding getting to see all these kids grow up. What's the worst thing that ever happened to you? Hmm. I get man, and it's happened multiple times. But having to see my mother cry—that's that's a pretty horrible, silly, and horrible thing to see and witness. What's your pet peeve? Um, I guess this kind of goes hand in hand, but lazy people and people who aren't uh, true to their word. I guess I could say, mm-hmm. you know, so I mean, I know it's basically kind of like a liar, but people yeah, who aren't of their word and people who are lazy, I just, wow, I just cannot stand it. You know, I've uh, I've been out in the workforce. I've, you know, got family members who, you know, unfortunately are kind of like that. And it's just people in the gym here, you know, and I'm like, man, everybody wants it. They all talk about it, but they're not all really about it. You know, not everyone is willing to work for it, you know. Everyone wants to be a diamond, but few are willing to get cut, you know. Not everyone can handle the pressure, and that's kind of what I see sometimes. Anything you want in life, you got to work hard for it. you got to sacrifice for it. you got to dedicate yourself for it, you know. Like, you got to do all the, every little thing you can to go out and, you know, achieve your goal, right? Accomplish what you want to accomplish. And when I see people, you know, not wanting to go out and do that or not doing that for whatever reason, yeah, it's just kind of like, man, are you serious? Like, I just, yeah, I just can't stand people like that. Person you look up to the most? Person I look up to the most. Ooh, man, I'd have to, you know, say my my parents, and I can give a little reason why on both ends. Uh, my mother, you know, um, I'm the oldest of three, uh, two younger sisters, and we're all the C-sections, but mm-hmm. she lost the most blood with me, and she was nearly on her, you know, deathbed, but had to have a blood transfusion, and, you know, she made it, man. She, she made it through, and even though... Things didn't work out between my parents. She still suffered, sacrificed, and worked so hard. And that's where I get my work ethic from. I'd say is um, her and then my father's then is the same. You know, uh, like I said, my whole family coming here with nothing but the clothes on their backs. And uh, he taught himself just basically how to do everything, you know, speak English, um, work, get a job here, get a citizenship, and... And now, you know, he uh, lives a good life, man. He's uh, got a nice house. He's uh, been with con- working construction for over, I want to say, 20 years, uh, almost as long as I've been alive. And, uh, you know, and he still works, still continues to work, and still, uh, he's a singer, actually. So still continues to sing and wants to make it being a singer, and I know he's really great. People love his music. Some people are afraid of spiders. Some people are afraid of heights. Some people are afraid of the dark. What are you afraid of? I guess, um, uh, kind of like a little mix right here. I'm terrified of motorcycles, even though I want one. You know, everyone tells you, be careful, be careful. Oh, my God, right. don't be doing stupid. I'm like, no, dude, seriously. I understand, like, these things are dangerous, and, you know, you could get seriously hurt or lose your life on this thing. Mm. Motorcycles terrify me, but I love them. You know, I guess it's like the same thing with fighting. I realize what can happen to me in there, but I still love it. You know, I mean, that's just like driving a car or anything else, really. You know, we we got to do it, and it's just, it is what it is. And it's kind of ironic, but it's almost like Batman right here. You know, why bats? Because bats frighten him. Well, I'm kind of, I'm afraid of blood. Actually, the sight of blood kind of tears on me, so red is my favorite color. But I kind of just use that as saying, oh, okay, the matador uses red to intimidate the bull. Well, I don't get it, but, yeah, blood, and actually, I remember when I used to see blood, it kind of terrified me. Time period you'd like to go back and visit, and why? I guess I want these kids to see it and live through it too, but uh, maybe 1998, 97, when, you know, computers weren't that huge, smartphones weren't even, you know, there was no such thing, even cell phones really, it was very rare that anyone had a cell phone. Pagers were still around back then, Mm -hmm. you know, but now the kids nowadays, yeah, they all got, uh, you know, smartphones. It's crazy. All these kids got smartphones, they'll never know what a a huge, uh, what was it, uh, Nokia? Looks like right. you know, these big brick <laughs> right. Phones, right? The Zach Morris. Oh, yeah, yeah. Motorola cell yeah. phone, yeah. <laughs> what do you worry about? What's something that keeps you up at night? What I worry about? I guess uh not living up to my true potential, you know, not being what I know I can be. Not uh, you know, yeah, fulfilling what I know I can fulfill, have the potential to fulfill or do in anything in my life, you know. Um I never want to miss a day, you know, like short our time here, you know, short, life is so precious, 
So, yeah, you know, I never want to miss an opportunity to, in, in every aspect of my life, like I said, not just martial arts, but be a better brother, be a better jiu-jitsu coach, and not better uncle, son, all of the above. I always want to be better in every aspect of my life and be a, a great human being. What's your hidden talent? My hidden talent? Oof. Well, like, as you've seen some of my pre-fight hypes, or if you follow me on any of my forms of social media, I'm a, quite a rhymer. Uh, I'm, I'm pretty good at rhyming. I used to love writing poetry as well in high school. Um, uh, there's that, and, huh, wow. Hmm. Man, it sucks. What else my talent is that? I'm trying to, I guess, just a great uh, motivator, I guess, you know, um... I, it's, it's pretty great that I've had people, you know, approach me that I didn't even know or do know and tell me that I inspire them and motivate them. That's good. You know, I want to be that. Not just me be it, but I'm saying that is what motivates me as well. Me helping encourage other people, motivate other people, anything, you know, is what does that for me. You know, i got to practice what I preach. So it's, it's pretty awesome that uh, I can, I'm, I'm self-motivated and I can help motivate people as well. Number one thing on your bucket list um, definitely travel the world. So, I mean, I guess that's kind of like, you know, it's hard to say one specific place because mm -hmm. I obviously want to see the island of Hawaii, so all of them, you know, uh, Brazil and Thailand, of course, and Japan. So, you know, travel a little bit. Um, to train, of course. I mean, I hate to say, oh, hey, yeah, vacation, but for me, right. it's like seeing what another world like, looks like and also seeing where martial arts came from, you know, different forms of martial arts. So... I think uh, that would that would be huge for me to be able to say that you know, hey, wow, yeah, I did this, and uh, uh, I'm here, like, you know, the home of where uh, all this all started from. Emmanuel, last question: If you could change one thing about the world, what would you change, and why? Oh, man, so much negativity. I'd have to say uh, positivity, peace, and love. So many people, you know, with. with all the things that, are, that you hear about nowadays, stuff that's happening on airplanes, stuff that's happening in the street, in the world, just in the regular news, and all over, you know, cities, all over. It's like someone said negative about this one, someone's sexual orientation, someone's faith, someone's was wearing the wrong colored shirt, you know, and they were made fun of or they were attacked for it. It's, uh, it's just ridiculous, and it's, it's sad, you know. It's really sad that that, you know, obviously it's not these... I'm not going to say a specific group of people, but it's like what is being taught in the media, in the world, by parents. You know, it just goes on from generation to generation, and it just, you know, it, that's what it breeds. You know, it breeds, uh, you know, just negative, horrible things, and, you know, it's very sad. So I'd want to, you know, change it. I'm not saying make America great again, because it's like, were we ever really great? You know, was there ever really anything great with all these things that's happened decade after decade, you know, different things that have happened? But I'd have to say definitely, you know, uh, I know the world is never going to be uh, sunshine and rainbows every single day, but definitely more love and positivity towards one another and not discriminating against a certain, like I said, sexual orientation, faith, race, uh, any form of belief, you know, out there in the world. Because that's, you know, it's breaking this world apart and down. Emmanuel, real quick before I let you go, do you have any sponsors you'd like to thank, and is there anything you want to say to the fans? Uh, thank you so much for this uh, opportunity, this interview. It's great to have my voice heard. I appreciate it very much. Um, shout out to uh, Combat Corner for all my training gear. I got the best gear in the game. Grit mouth guards for protecting my dentals, as we were speaking of. The best uh, gear is up grit. My teeth are beautiful. Great. I got to take care of them, of course. Diamond and makeup. Of course, for protecting the sending of jewels if I ever do choose to have children one day. <laughs> um, I have uh, Vaporfy, of course, to for sponsoring for my lab site and hopefully, you know, going for the next one as well and going to a great future right here. I have uh, my guy, Iowa Bison. The Matador loves his bison, so Iowa Bison gives you the best clean, free range, best uh, bison meat you will ever get. You know, uh, building a healthy lifestyle, have some good, good protein, you know what I mean? The Matador loves his bison. And um, uh, McBride Mets, Clayton McBride and McBride Mets, the sponsors our gym at here at Rufus Sport MMA Academy and Rufus Sports for not only are they always in my corner, but uh, I wouldn't have what I had today if it wasn't for Duke. You know, it, it's really good. Like I said, I started my career alone, and once I had Duke, I just, boom, I took off, and uh, it's been really crazy. It's almost like this is the best thing that ever happened to me, and uh, very happy for and blessed, fortunate, grateful for what I have now. Emmanuel, thank you for taking the time to talk. I really appreciate it. 
Thank you, sir. Pardon me. I'm uh, late to teach my jiu-jitsu class, so I'm going to get right here and teach these kids now.